Hi, I'm Sarah Grace McCandless, and welcome to On Brand, where we take a closer look at this growing desire for true connection with the companies that we engage with. You know, there are a couple of things that I'm really passionate about. Connection, companies that have purpose and live their purpose, not just in the leadership, but through the experience, both with employees and customers. And if you spend about five minutes with me, you'll also find out that there are other things I'm passionate about. I love dogs. I love dance and I love ice cream. And that's why I am so excited for today's guest because really it is a combination of my love for customer experience and connection with something I love from a product standpoint as well. With me today is Natasha Case, who is the CEO and co-founder of Cool House Ice Cream. Natasha, welcome to On Brand. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much for being here. So I get really excited when I can talk to uh, you know founders of, of brands, but when it's a brand that I truly love, it elevates it to a whole new level for me. I literally have nine pints of your ice cream in my freezer right now. Um, and it is something I've just become so endeared with. Um, before I get into talking to you a little bit about uh, how the company came to be, can you tell us a little bit about your background? Yeah, so um, you know, I kind of have an unusual, like, I'd say, like path to uh, becoming an ice cream lady. I started off in architecture and design. Um, I think I always thought of architecture as a skill set that could be very broad and have a broad application, um, and uh, maybe you know, kind of like uh, how it can also be used to make things more approachable, less intimidating. Um, but I don't, I didn't know what that would look like. And, um, like many, I think big moments in life, they can sort of come by accident. I actually, in one of my, um, uh, studios, I went to, to Berkeley for architecture school, a professor of mine criticized a scale model that I had made. He said it looked like a layer cake. And I thought, why is that bad? Layer cakes are delicious. Uh, so I actually ended up baking the next iteration of the model as a cake. And I had so much fun, um, with that creation, um, and that was my only all-nighter in all of architecture school. And when I presented it, I could see my colleagues were so much more engaged because food is, it creates memories. It's, it's especially ice cream. I mean, if you love ice cream, it's this, it's, it's an emotional eating experience. Like it's like takes you back to childhood. It's, it's just, it's really just so cool. There's so much to play with there. So I, I just fell in love with merging two of my passions, food and design. And I played around with that intersection all through graduate school. I started calling it for architecture. And uh, my first job after grad school was Disney Imagineering, uh, where I was for a month or two before the recession hit um, back in 2009. So in many ways, feels kind of full circle to this moment, even though it looked very different. Um, the, uh, the kind of the energy was, was similar of a lot of people sort of pivoting and changing their paths and reinventing. And so as part of the food meets design idea, I started making ice cream sandwiches from scratch, naming the combinations after architects and giving them to friends at work who had gotten un unfortunate bad news, um, you know, being laid off from Disney and, or, or whatnot. And I met the other co-founder, uh, my now wife, Freya Estreller, who had more of a business background. And uh, together we saw there was a huge opportunity to make better ice cream, um, but also to make a brand that we felt represented us as women, um, as gay women, Freya as a woman of color, as millennials. We just didn't feel that there was this authentic creator to customer, you know, um, element happening on the shelf. So um, we decided that, hey, why not us? You know, let's, we're 25 years old, let's make this happen. We bought a, po a postal van with no engine that was uh, masquerading as an ice cream truck and a AAA platinum membership that came with a 200 mile tow. And we towed the truck to Coachella, and that's that's how I launched the company. So that that's how I became an ice cream lady. <laughs> oh, I love that story. That's so interesting too. How this evolution from your architecture background into you know essentially food and brand design too. And you're right. You know, ice cream is is really personal, and I'm sure it evokes a lot of nostalgia for people. It certainly does for me. It's a, a really strong memory I have with my father. Um, and kind of chanting um, in a way when I was younger to get him to go to our local ice cream shop when I was in Michigan growing up. Um, so this is pretty ingenious. So you you are getting a van that doesn't operate, doesn't even drive. You figure out a way to get it to Coachella, which was, I mean, it was a big deal. It's an even bigger deal now, right? But a big deal back then. 
talk to me about how, take me through that first experience, that weekend in Coachella. You get there, very ingenious way to get the truck there. Then what happens? So it's so kind of you to say ingenious because, it, you know, thinking thinking of being there that weekend, I don't know that uh, with everything we were sorting out that we felt that ingenious, but we made it there. So yes, that, that was a good, and uh, that was a good bootstrapping uh, feat for sure. Um, so the actual festival, I mean, it's, it's crazy how much can change in a little over a decade. Uh, firstly, um, we were the first food truck to ever sell at Coachella. And, you know, now not only have there been many, many more food trucks to come after us, but there's like five course dining experiences and, you know, Michelin star chefs and just so much happening there. So it was a much kind of simpler concert back then. So I think the timing was really good to stand out and to bring something different. Um, it, it looked and felt very haphazard, but um, we were there and we were, we had the ice cream sandwiches and we were basically tapping into a captive audience. That's very much our crowd. It was, you know, millennial, cool people who were, um, let's say, in, you know, were in altered states and looking to indulge in some really good ice cream. And we were in the campground. So um, it, it, back then it was, you know, you didn't have people come for the whole weekend. That was one of the only places where you really had people there like all four days. So we kind of built this little like cult following, you know, there in the campground. Um, and we were there the whole time. We had, the rules were we had to camp at the truck. So you're like in a tent next to the truck, you know, the festival end around midnight. People are partying till 3 or 4 a.m. And people would then start to line up for ice cream at 7 or 8 a.m. So it was a very, uh, you know, there's, it was a, it was an interesting and amazing experience, but it's kind of what we needed to have proof of concept and to think about scale right away as we launched the company. And then out of Coachella, I, uh, a friend of mine had said, Hey, if it goes well, or if you're, if you've survived, send me your logo and I'll do a piece on, on Cool House and you know get the word out and so i was like okay we're still standing and i sent him the basics of our logo our social media handle and this friend he wrote an article that wasn't even particularly flattering it was like uh if you you know want some weird ice cream you have nothing to do check out cool house and i was like great thanks for that that piece but it didn't matter it went viral to you know la times dwell because of the architecture angle yeah. eater apartment therapy angelino i was answering press calls the whole way home from coachella and also on our social media handle, we had about 10,000 followers by the day we got back, which seemed like a huge deal at the time. So um, it was like everything telling us, hey, keep going with this idea. You know, we did minimum viable product to get there. And we learned that there's something more to be uh, achieved with our ice cream tree. <laughs> yeah, I love that. You know, I mean, you mentioned that it kind of went viral and this is 2009. So, I mean, this is you know, social as we know, it was really kind of picking up steam around then. If you think about Facebook and Twitter coming into the world 2006, 2007, it hadn't been that long. And I think a lot of brands were still figuring out how to even use social yeah. um, and this sense evolved. I want to come back to that, but t tell me a little bit about the name, how that came to be. Yeah. So I love puns. Um, I'm one of those, like the puns just, just come. Sometimes I, I can't turn it off and I probably should. And, um, but uh, we always wanted to have these like punny architectural, you know, names to the sandwiches. So we had uh, uh, Frank Berry, Mies Vanilla Row, Mintimalism. Um, and the idea was to kind of bring some lightness to what was a challenging time in many industries and definitely architecture and to create awareness about architects through food. Cause my idea is like food, people let their guard down. It's less intimidating. If you felt like, oh, I, architects are so cool, but I feel like I, you know, I'm afraid to ask questions or the basics. And then you're like, well, here's an ice cream sandwich, you know, mm -hmm. to help you on the basics. Like, okay, that, that, that I can do, you know? Um, but we didn't have a brand name. So actually a friend of ours said, you know, Rem Kulhas, he should have a sandwich. And Rem Kulhas is one of my favorite architects, very outside the box, very interdisciplinary. And I kind of looked at Freya, although she says that she sort of looked at me. <laughs> yeah, so it depends who you ask. Um, but then we yeah, said so that, you know, that would be a really cool name for the, the company. It sounds like ice cream, cool house. And then we said we should, you know, the H-A-U-S after Bauhaus, which is also one of my favorite mm -hmm. movements. Again, very big picture. Like, yes, we know Bauhaus architecture, but great sculpture, great art, great writing, and a lot of great women um, uh, that were part of that movement. So 
that's how it was created, that, that double entendre, that house from Cool House, and then the triple entendre, like the sandwiches kind of with like little cold houses. That one's a bit of a stretch, but you know, the cookies, floor slab and roof and the ice cream walls, so. That's yeah, it. well, I mean, it really is. It's uh, such an interesting marriage of your architecture background into a space where you may not necessarily uh, anticipate that. Now, you mentioned, too, that, you know, you one of the inspirations for creating the company and the brand was that you were looking at the shelves and not really feeling like you were represented. Um, I think that's a great segue to talk a little bit more about the brand mission and the brand purpose. How would you describe that? What are those pillars that really guide and drive you as you grow your business. Yeah, and those, are, I would say the brand mission pillars, like just knowing those and um, and living those are so key, especially now. And also I wanna say that a lot of them are there, like they're there in your origin if you look, but it, you may not be aware of them out the gate. You know, sometimes you, you it takes a minute for you to come to know what you're building as a brand and that's okay. So I just wanna encourage people like to be patient with yourself and your company in terms of getting there. And there may be things that are more meaningful to highlight, like depending on where you are in your company arc or where the world is. Like there may be an aspect of your story that appeals more or less to people at a certain point as you're growing the company. So just as a preface, but I would say like the biggest kind of from like the, the social mission standpoint is how can we use Cool House as a platform, as, as leaders to empower the next generation of you know women and girls from diverse backgrounds to also create their you know entrepreneurial business dreams or really you know their dreams it's like not like you have to be a business owner but that's that's something that that we know and that that's what we've built so how can we pass that on and that can be anything from literally just you know telling your story because so much of it is like it, it, it's easier to be what you can see you know so the more examples you see great and if people are leading with how their story is diverse you know for us as women for me as an LGBTQ founder, um, whatever that may be for you, I think that's also great. You can inspire maybe more of, of, of that community um, to, to live out their dreams. Uh, but also, you know, mentorship, teaching, webinars, public speaking, um, having literal um, products or projects that help make that investment. For example, we have a new flavor we're launching with Black Girl Ventures, and um, it's called Currency Cake. And the idea is, you know, we made this great carrot cake batter, delicious ice cream, and the proceeds of profits go to funding one of their grants for marketing and IP needs, which the Shelly Bell, who's the phenomenal founder of Black Girl Ventures, she really identified as that's one of the resources that's really lacking for black and brown female founders who are that, that's what they're 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 really like creating the pipeline for. So it's like literally having the platform, getting the word out about them, what they do, but also helping to fund, helping to, you know, uh, put the dollars where, where the talk is, I think is, is really, really important. And, um, you know, aligning with any kind of project and, and product like that, that can really create meaning is I think um, amazing and, and really important to, to me and the company. And then I would say from a product standpoint, um, you know, the novelties, meaning ice cream sandwiches, um, the the cups, the cones that are coming out uh, this year, all on dairy and dairy free, really leaning into those and making those the best and the highest quality and being able to be both dairy and dairy free and, and succeed at both of those and doing that in a unique way. So that's really, really important, like just from a pure product standpoint, like that's really what makes the brand special. That's how we started. How can we really create the most unique value proposition for that product line? Yeah, um, I think that's really important too. I mean, it, and I love what you said about it's okay to evolve and change, and but you got to start somewhere, right? And you know, one of the things that you did start from the get go is you know female led, female founded, um, and in fact, I mean, it's it's on your packaging too. Um, you know, what was that process of going through becoming a certified woman owned business and? Um, why do you feel like that's so important um, to put front and center when communicating your brand and your products as well? Um, I think it's, well, why we did it and why it's important is, uh, you know, I the goal would be, at least from my point of view, is that uh, things are equal enough that you don't have to call it out. You know, like ultimately, we want to get to a place of equal opportunity and equal um, representation in industry and leadership and funding and all of those things. Um, and, but while it's so unequal, you know, let's let people know um, who we are and, and kind of 
you know, that 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 more women or minority perspective, I think, is really important to share. And then I think you have to do it in a way that's like on a silver platter, really easy for people to understand, very clear, you know, right there um, for um, the customer to ascertain in like a second or less. You know, in CPG, consumer packaged goods, that's all the time you have. Like people are walking up and down the freezer aisle and, uh, you know, but your products behind condensation on the freezer door. And it's just got to be, it's got to be right there. You know, before we did the certification and that icon, we had, you know, the story on the back of the packaging and it said Fred and Natasha co-founders, but it's asking people to read a paragraph and, and some do and hopefully more do. And, and that's really important to have it there too, but it's got to be right there if it's something of value to you. Um, so that, that's why I, I think that that's really um, important. And, and now actually it says women founded and led. And I think that's been really the way to frame that for, again, the consumer of what they want to know. They want to know who created this brand and who's still leading it. Is a woman still running the business? Um, because it's really, really rare in my space to find that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it definitely made a difference. It was a huge driver for me. And it's a lot about what, you know, when I talk to different guests on the show, one of the core focuses is not just saying your purpose, but living and demonstrating it. And that this desire for connection, I wanted, I do want to know who you are and what's behind the company and what's the story there. And, you know, um, where is the inclusion and diversity? Is it, is it just a statement that's on a website or is it really being, you know, are you, are you living and breathing it? And you certainly see it with this brand. And I think it really makes it stand out. I'm the person, by the way, who stops and reads the paragraph on the back. <laughs> yeah, back to me. Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I really love that too. I mean, can you talk to me a little bit about, you mentioned the customer and I'm, I'm curious about um, your thoughts on customer experience. What makes for a good customer experience and what you've learned uh, from being in this space? I think, yes, I think uh, the clear, uh, t today's customer wants, um, you know, is voting with their dollar. So what can you communicate about what you want to do and your mission um, and or your story that's going to resonate and be like easy to understand um, and, and clear your, that value proposition is there. And I think the customer understanding the di differentiation points with your product is, is so, so important. You know, um, like I was saying in ice cream, uh, the, the biggest competition by far is in, in the pints. You know, first of all, you have the huge players like Ben and Jerry's, Hagen dazs you know, Talenti, and they're, you know, owning a lot of that real estate. And then you have a lot of smaller ones who are coming in that are regional, more local, really doing unique flavors, which is all fantastic. But um, it's kind of the lowest barrier to entry to get into the ice cream market. So for us, having the novelties is is it's a it can be a huge pain in the butt. So just like let us handle that for you, and being able to do both dairy and dairy free um, well, and um, not having to decide. Like I, I call my, myself like a flexitarian. Like I have no problem eating dairy, but I love eating vegan dairy free products that are delicious. Um, and then also there's people who are practicing vegans or lactose intolerant and they need something that's just for them. So, um, making it, it really easy to understand why that's special and our, our, uh, dairy free base also is made from peas and brown rice and cocoa butter. There's really nothing like it. Everything is really coconut cashew. Um, so it's pretty different. Um, so just, we gotta be really, really clear. It's gotta be really easy for folks and you just, you stick with that, you know? And, um, after that, I think you have a good strategy to communicate it and, um, you know, lean in as much as you can and, uh, build, start really building your audience. Uh, I, for the record, I'm a flexitarian as well. I, 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 and I love it. And I mean, I'm in Portland, Oregon. So, I mean, we are blessed to have a lot of vegan and vegetarian, options and restaurants here also kind of talk about food trucks. That's like, you know, ingrained in the culture here too, but you were way ahead of your time on that. Um, you know, I want to circle back to something that you said earlier uh, when you started and everything on Coachella, we talked a little bit about social and things that really picked up um, in social. Where's social sit now in terms of strategy or connection with consumers? Are you using it? Are you hearing stories? Are you getting feedback? How's that working for you now? Well, I think um, I think for me, the way that I see it is you have to be uh, purposeful and uh, maybe go deeper with a strategy that's going to be really work for you and be really authentic and special. Because I don't think that you can really be in every kind of social bucket. There's so there's so many platforms now. And then even within like Instagram, let's say there's like, 
you know, all the organic kind of, you know, the, the reels, the, the static posts, the stories, you know, the live, there's so much. And then there's paid, obviously. And, and it, it really is at this point a pay to play game. And for me, I can't, you know, being a, you know, we're, we're growing, you know, we're getting there. But um, to really be able to, uh, you know, I get, get, get a consumer's attention. First of all, I don't know if it matters how much money you have. It's really hard to do. It's so crowded. We've all been on our devices for a whole year. People are super exhausted by it. So, you know, can you get the consumer's attention? How much money is that going to cost? And are you, what's the lifetime value of that consumer? Um, really, really like dig into that PL and understand it. And, and for me, like, I don't really have the e-com business as much for more of a grocery company mm -hmm. um, as far as the scale. And then, you know, you can book the trucks for events. You can come to our shop. You can order on delivery apps. Um, but those are not things where like paid social to me um, is really as much going to move the dial. Where I am interested in it is like you have something really exciting to say and there's a great kind of using the organic tools to do that. And the partnerships, I think um, I'm interested in, um, I'm more interested in, in that. Um, and then frankly, this year, getting out of digital and coming back to the experiences and the activations, maybe even some out of home, you know, like billboard. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think in a way we've like, you know, things are kind of coming back, like having a great website. Cause I think we've gone through a period of time where like it was Instagram first. I kind of see it now coming back to your website, especially because Shopify is such a fantastic um, platform um, for, you know, doing so many different kind of powerful marketing um, yeah. campaigns. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a little bit like it's it's important. It's there, and I think it's great for community engagement and, and those things that I said. But I don't I, I don't see that as being like a. Uh, I think you should question every bucket where you're going to spend money and really think about like, am I just doing this because I think I have to, or is it actually going to move the dial for me? Yeah, I think that's great advice, and you don't have to be everywhere just because it's there. Um, I, you know, one thing I'll say, just again from a, I'm a brand fan, but. You know, your website is a very cohesive experience to what you do on social. And, and I don't see that all the time. Sometimes it's when I'm working with clients, it's, you know, where the advisement starts with making that experience a little bit more cohesive. So you don't feel like you're talking to one brand at the dot com and another in social that it feels like one, right. one company. I actually really love how on your website, too, it's like the pints are kind of cut in half. You can see inside. <laughs> yes, so I love I but that's what I want to see. I mean, that just that really, you know, drives me, too. So I think that's um, really interesting. You know, uh, the other thing I want to make sure I ask you about, you know, we're talking about your brand and then we talked about your origin. You know, you did work with Disney, which is one of the biggest global brands in the world. Did that. Um, influence or inspire you? Are there things that you learned from that experience that you either thought, uh, I definitely want to do that, or I definitely don't want to do that from, from working there? Yeah. I mean, it, it was great to be at such a big company to start. I kind of equated to like, I feel like a lot of tech founders, you know, come out of the Google or mm -hmm. um, some of the larger companies and you, and you learn, you learn some of the ropes, you kind of, you know, cut your teeth and then move on to much smaller startup experience. Um, and Disney is the ultimate, if you're talking about brands, I mean, the way that they have built that brand and the way they tell the stories of the characters, you know, um, of the, the, the films of, of, of these worlds that they create, they are the absolute, you know, just they're phenoms at that. And, and they create stories that people love for their whole lives intergenerationally uh, even i mean you know i have a, a soon to be four-year-old and a 10-month-old and you just it's a, it's like some of the these movies like he was watching inside out the other day it's like such an adult movie but then a kid he was just enamored you know the whole time so um i think there's you know clearly genius in that craft um, and, but I think the biggest thing for me that I saw was like, okay, it's really, um, you, it's about experiences and you create the whole brand experience. And you think about like Disneyland, for example, as a park, like that was way ahead of its time in terms of now how we talk about like activation experience and bringing marketing to life. Um, and that, that was like, definitely like how to use kind of like architecture and spaces to do that. Um, how you can take a story and how it can be all these different things It can be a consumer product. It can be. Of media, it can be, you know, that actual thing you go and do. Mm -hmm. And I think that's all really influenced me and my company, you know, the trucks and these brand activations, those are experiences, then there's the product, then there's a way we tell the story, how we use, you know, media, mediums. Um, and those things, you know, you know, all those things inform each other, like, 
there'd be no point in for with Disney, for example, like buying like a figurine if you didn't watch the movie that made you excited about that. And I see Remy like play with his like his like a Moana boat, my, my four-year-old son, for hours because he's like living the movie in his mind. So for us, it's like cool house if you can make the connection with all those different things we do then it's so much more than the ice cream sandwich, you know, or the cone, whatever. So um, I think that that influenced me a lot. And um, especially like the, the doing the brand, the packaging, being so close to it. Um, that's, that's something that I think um, kind of like that skinning of the whole brand that really, really um, was huge for me and how I lead my business, both from my architecture background and, and working in Imagineering. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the cone again, which I, <laughs> oh yeah, I'm, I'm real excited about this. My summer just got, I don't know when it's coming, but my it, summer. April, May, all okay. things for the dairy and then Thrive Market for all the dairy free. Well, 2021 is already so much better. Um, <laughs> just on that news alone. Um, and, you know, you but just. Because 2020 was just that bad, but I still, I know what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, you know, it was, it was, and it certainly, and it was challenging. I was just about to ask you about that, but I have to say personally too, I have a lot of gratitude over what, for some things that happened over the last year. I'm not sure what happened without said circumstances, right? And so sometimes yeah. that a crisis comes that change or learning. How, how was that for you? Um, you know, you mentioned also getting back to activations and I'm sure that that had an impact on sort of in-person um, type of events or, yeah. or ideas that you had, but is there something that kind of sticks out um, as you, as we're not out of it yet, we're coming out of it, but something, a takeaway from this last year? Yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot of really important silver linings. Um, I agree with you. And I think um, the most challenging times come with the greatest kind of uh innovation, rethinking, recalibration. I think 2020 changed us, changed us all. I think for me, a couple different things. I think first of all, a lot of like for, with COVID, you know, comes from, uh, you know, our, the way we treat our environment and, um, and that we are, you know, infringing on animal spaces and catching their diseases, you know? And, and I think um, I, I'm really excited to, to grow the dairy free and make that a, a really big part of our business. Um, you know, it's a, it's a, there's a great sustainable element to that. Um, thinking about how we, how we make things, how we manufacture, how we source, uh, the packaging, everything's opportunity to do something um, helpful for the planet, to give back to our planet that we take so much from. Um, I think the, the, you know, a lot, I think through BLM, but kind of spurring so much about, you know, uh, looking at companies and, and asking for more and asking for companies to do more um is is fantastic like yeah why, why wouldn't we all we, we know we can do better like let's do better and let's use every resource that we have every platform that we have to help move that dial mm -hmm. uh, and let's always take opportunities to like re-examine you know cultures that we're building and, and as as a society and as individuals so i think um that's that's super important you know i've young children so i think you always think about like okay like this is a new generations coming up and what are, what are we, you know, handing off to them? Um, and then I think as far as like more even like tactically within the business, I think there was a lot of trends that were in motion that were accelerated by last year. For example, um, you know, delivery apps uh, like was like 10, 15% of our shop business, you know, the Uber Eats and DoorDashes of the world. And that became our whole shop business for basically a whole year. And we managed to run it pretty close to our goal budgets with a really efficient bottom line. And it kind of makes you think, well, how can we keep doing more of that? Um, even as we have the opportunity to reopen, let's be smart about it. You know, let's um, get more people product through those channels. Let's give them a better offering. Let's make unique offerings. Like we did a partnership with Amazon for a bunch of their shows coming out this summer. And we offered limited type only sandwiches to celebrate those shows on our delivery platforms. And they sold out within minutes. So how can we like light these up? You know, we started growing in ghost kitchens and dark kitchens a lot last year, which we're expanding hugely this year. Um, and those are just fascinating kind of virtual restaurant models, which I, I think, you know, a lot of restaurants that didn't unfortunately are not going to survive all the havoc of last year, which is a whole other, there's so many things tied up in that. And there's so many problems there, but you could imagine a lot of restaurants living on, in a in the kind of virtual delivery only, you know, that could that be an interesting second life? So I think there's so many, so many things at play. And I just um I think you have to see it as, you know, 
I, I don't want to use the word opportunistic, but see problems as opportunities to do better. Yeah, I agree with that too. I think there's a lot of evolution that's come out of this too, um, you know, that we can all kind of learn from. You know, you've mentioned a couple different partnerships. You also uh, recently launched a new flavor with Allegro coffee, which is delicious. And to be honest with you, a coffee ice cream is not necessarily my first go-to. You put something with like caramel in there, something salted. I'm all over that. Your chocolate molten cake is like one of my favorite. I love Hey Cupcake too. <laughs> I, but I, I, I went in, you know, and I was like, well, this is what coffee ice cream is supposed to taste like. Thank but you. there is, again, there's a lot of purpose in this partnership. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and maybe, um, you know, what influences your decision on, on who to partner with? Yeah. So that's, no, the Queen's Coffee was a super exciting partnership with Whole Foods. Um, we launched it for International Women's Day last year. And they connected us to Allegro Coffee, which is a really big coffee partner of theirs, um, who had one of the farms they sourced from uh, in East Rwanda was women uh, run. And um, they, they connected us and they said, you know, maybe there's something here. We created this coffee ice cream with their beans, one of their blends actually called um, Queen's Cup. And so we called it Queen's Coffee and shouted them out and had the story on the packaging and had their logo. And, you know, the timing of when everyone's looking at, at this Women's Day in month, which I have to say is fantastic, but also, we you know, every day is International Women's Day and every <laughs> Women's Month. But, um, uh, and then we want to do something really clever with the marketing, get the word out. And so we actually did a billboard campaign around L.A. Um, and it said, um, uh, ice cream fit for a queen, call us Megan. And it was a shout out to Meghan Markle. Um, she was just going through just so much terrible treatment and, and, and racism, um, you know, kind of newly um, entering the royal family at that point. And it was a show of support um, for her and um, kind of a way to connect the dots. And we ended up also donating proceeds uh, from sales of that pint to one of her favorite charities, which is, um, you know, Women of Color Entrepreneurship Fund. And she actually ended up reaching out. She, uh, from the, the Duchess of Sussex uh, uh, Instagram handle to both me personally and Cool House, um, saying that she, you know, wanted to connect. So that was really, really cool to get the acknowledgement. She, she didn't call us, but, you know, DM, but same, similar idea. Um, so it just, a way to like, create something delicious, create awareness about women leadership, what it can look like, how we can partner and do it in a way that's authentic to the brand, tell story and have fun with the marketing. So I don't know, sign me up for more of those, please. Uh, I love that story. And I, I just started watching The Crown. I'm on season one, like episode three, right? I'm way behind. But you yep. said Queen's Coffee and I was like, but I did watch Queen's Gambit, which I loved. But yeah. now I'm going to eat that while I'm watching The Crown. Um, I love that story. And, you know, you've talked a lot about the importance of storytelling, too, which also just really speaks to my heart. I'm a, a writer um, by trade. And I think story is is so important and knowing yours and being authentic to who you are, which you certainly have identified here. Um, you know, what advice would you give? to other uh, female entrepreneurs? You, you had a few things you said at the beginning there, but what are some things that you've learned maybe from some challenging situations or just some things to kind of keep in mind of where to begin? So I think first um, you walk through a wall when you don't know it's there. So that's one of my uh, early mentors told me, which is basically it means that sometimes a little bit of naivete, a little bit of not fully knowing what you're doing can actually be helpful because uh, if you know too much, you can get into analysis paralysis mode and you don't take certain risks. Like I think like if I, you know, my 25 year old self was pitching my now 37 year old self. Oh, I have this ice cream truck idea. I'm going to launch it at Coachella. Like, Ooh, wait, if you looked at the ice cream industry, it's challenging. What's, how are you going to scale this? You know, like you, you know a lot, which is great. But, um, I, the point is, uh, with that, um, those words is like, you can, you can be empowered knowing less, I think. Do your basic research, you know, take um, smart, calculated risks. But um, I think I think it's OK to just get it out there. And, um, you know, if there was perfect answers, um, it would be easy to create all these businesses. And it's not. And then I would also say, uh, be really clear with your vision as a woman entrepreneur, um, both with the company. I like vision plans, like do your like two year, five year, 10 year, you know, write it all down write it in present tense, make it detailed, make it real, and then do one for yourself. I think as women, we're like very, we be very selfless, which can be, you know, 
is coming from a good place, but it's important to think like, am I going to love doing this? Am I going to be able to, you know, live off, uh, you know, my, my work and support myself and potentially others? And will I be happy? Will I be fulfilled? Like think of you in all of this, you know, that's really important. Um, you're not here to, um, you know, you don't need to like prove your self worth to anyone. You know, if you're doing this, it's it's going to take so much hustle, and you believe in an idea. Um, you know, be empowered to to put yourself also um, as a priority. Um, so, because that's something I see a lot of women entrepreneurs not do as much, and more man, man entrepreneurs do. So, those those are my two main words. That's great advice. Um, you know, just to kind of uh, wrap things up, it's been so insightful um, and wonderful to talk to you. Um, tell us a little bit about what's next for Cool House. You mentioned, um, it's still in my head right now, I can't, now I'm obsessed about it with the cones coming. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, we're in a new year, uh, things are kind of shifting and changing. You mentioned a desire to get back to that in-person experience. What's yes. on so yeah, so the new product, the cones, dairy dairy free, super excited. Uh, I mean, I I plan to bring back the events business, however we can do it. You know, mm -hmm. whether it's smaller scale events or whether you know the socially distanced outdoor festivals, whatever that may be. Also with the marketing, um, you know, we will be taking the cones to so many different locations to get people excited to try them with our trucks. Um, we'll be getting out there with the Black Girl Ventures Pine in April and May at, and, and really kind of reaching people. The trucks are a great, like, even while things are sort of in between full lockdown and normal life, like, trucks are, like, a very, you know, friendly to that environment. And um, we can be very mobile. Um, and we have new packaging coming out. We actually collaborated with il illustrator Mike Perry. And he created this whole cool world of our flavors and our stories. And it's all coming to life on the packaging. And it's me rolling out all year. It's really phenomenal. And then we also have a pride skew that we're bringing back called Enjoyment for All, which is a dairy-free like grasshopper. So mint, cookie, marshmallow, deliciousness that that will be coming out as well. Um, I say coming out, pun intended, um, in <laughs> June. So look, look for more excitement there. And um yeah, just a lot of, you know, I think more activation, partnership, all the things that we love doing, plan on really leaning in this year and, and continuing to grow the brand and let more people know what we're doing. Well, I can't wait to see all this roll out. Um, Natasha, thank you so much. I love your story. It's so inspirational and just kind of amazing what you've done and what you've built um, in just, you know, a little over a decade. So very excited to see what comes next. Thank you again for sharing a bit about your background and your vision with us as well. Thank you for having me. I really loved uh, talking with you. And, and thank you for all the great questions, too. You bet.